Hello and welcome. Thank you for tuning in today for another presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series today focused on learning from outtake photos, from photos that did not work out exactly as planned, perhaps. For those of you who are not familiar with me, my name is Tim Gray, and I have been helping photographers optimize their workflow and improve their photography for, well, more than two decades now. I'm not sure the exact number, but I do know, for example, many of you receive my daily Ask Tim Gray email newsletter, which I have been publishing now for just over 19 years, which is hard to believe all by itself. I started off writing books on a variety of subjects related to photography, Photoshop, photography itself, Lightroom Classic, etc., and more recently started producing video training courses and also leading online workshops in addition to field photography workshops, which I certainly anticipate will be able to lead once again next year in 2022. Perhaps even there will be some possibilities later this year. But thank you once again for joining me. During the presentation today, by the way, as always, for those of you who have attended some of my previous presentations, questions are most certainly welcome along the way. Questions or comments, if you've got your own thoughts that you'd like to share, I'd be happy to see those, and I'll address as many of those in real time during the presentation as I possibly can. So on the right side of your screen, you should see that question mark icon in the little thought bubble, and you can click that to expand a panel over on the right side where down at the bottom you'll find a field where you can type in your question or your comment, click that send button, and again, I'll address as many of those as I'm able to during the presentation today. And if I don't get to some of those, certainly they could appear in an upcoming edition of my Ask Tim Gray email newsletter, which if you're not receiving already, by the way, you can learn more about that and see recent questions and answers at asktimgray.com. But let's take a look at some outtake photos. Now, I would love to tell you that I do not have any outtake photos. I would love it even more if I could say that and you would actually believe me or if it was actually true because that certainly is not the case. And certainly, you know, an outtake essentially is something I define as just a photo that didn't work, a photo that is not what you had hoped for. In many cases, that might translate into a photo that deserves to be deleted but I also think it's very important to keep in mind that sometimes our outtakes, our, you might say, mistakes as photographers, can provide the best learning opportunities. And sometimes those outtakes are just necessary in order to create a photo that you're really happy with. And so I'll share a variety of examples today of different photos that maybe I wish had turned out just a little bit differently and the lessons that I learned along the way, the reasons that I think those outtakes in some respects are certainly just as important as some of my favorite photos, some of my, shall I say, best photos, but also in some ways you could say that the outtakes are even more important because those outtakes ultimately are what lead me to be a better photographer because I learn my lessons. I, I make a mistake, something doesn't work out, something unexpected happens, and I can review that outtake, that photo that didn't produce the result I thought I was going to get, and figure out how I can get the result that I was actually after. So let's take a look at some photos and consider what lessons can be learned from these outtakes. Now, okay, this image I didn't actually capture, so this isn't my outtake, but it is clearly an out-of-focus image, or maybe a little bit of motion blur to it. I'm not sure exactly why this photo wouldn't have been in focus. It's an old photo, an extremely old photo, actually. Uh, in fact, the reason that this is, you know, part of the reason that this is a photo that I really cherish, even though it's out of focus, is this is a tiny little Cessna 152, a two-seat airplane, and that's me waving from the pilot's seat. And this actually, part of the reason that this photo is special to me is not just that I earned my pilot's license when I was much younger, and that was something that I was very excited about and very proud of and wish that I had the time to keep up with. Unfortunately, I've not had the opportunity to do any real flying and also a couple of decades, coincidentally. And so that it's a special time when I earned my pilot's license, something I was very proud of. But this particular photo on this particular day is even more special to me because part of the reason that we were out at the airport was that my stepfather had been visiting and 
he essentially raised me. I think of him as my father. He had raised me as his son, and he was out there. Now, this is a man who was six foot six and about 250 pounds, mostly muscle, worked in construction, like a real serious guy, deep voice. He could scare you just by speaking up. And so I certainly had respect for him. And, you know, to me, I thought he was just, you know, the epitome of strength. And yet, when we got out to the airport, he was too scared to go up for a flight in this little airplane. And admittedly, it doesn't inspire confidence, this tiny little airplane with just two seats. But it, it was amusing to me that he was not comfortable going up in a little airplane, that this you know big, strong guy could actually be too scared to go for a ride in an airplane. And so it just is a, a fun, cherished memory for me. And this is a photo being out of focus that under normal circumstances might have gotten thrown away. I'm so glad that that was not the case, that I still have the image because it really is a cherished image. And I, I think one of the lessons there is that even an outtake can represent a cherished memory. And I think it also underscores that if you've got a photo that didn't work out as planned, you shouldn't necessarily just treat it as a failure because it still, as I mentioned, represents a learning opportunity, but it can still represent just a cherished memory, at least documenting a memory that you'd like to preserve even if the photo didn't work out as well as you had hoped. I also learned very early on, I know some of you have seen this next image on at least a couple of occasions, because at the time, this actually was not an outtake. I would really sort of consider it an outtake now, although it does represent a good memory for me as well. But this is the first photo that I was actually proud of. That was a very long time ago, back when I was in high school, so a, a significant amount of time ago, taking a photography class, a black and white film photography class, of course. I sort of consider this an outtake in terms of just the quality of the photo. I like to think that I'm a much better photographer now, at least I hope I am. But looking back, you know, I sort of have to laugh a little bit because I was so excited about this photo. I thought it was so great at the time. I've gotten better photos since, thank goodness. But this photo also taught me a couple of very valuable lessons in photography and really just related to the importance of paying attention and also to never stop learning. That, you know, at this point I was already kind of late in my class in photography in high school, so I thought I kind of had things pretty well figured out, but I didn't. (laughs) I had, you know, some of the basics figured out, but I still had a lot to learn. And even to this day, I still learn lessons from time to time, including from my own outtake photos. And so, As some of you may recall, if you've seen me share this photo before, number one was to realize, not at the time, but after the fact, when I made a contact sheet, that I was going to get a sunburst or a starburst effect up at the top right corner of the image. And this was a complete surprise to me, so I excitedly went to my photography teacher and said, look, look, look what happened with the sun. And she was probably uh, maybe mildly frustrated with me because I probably should have known better by then. She was like, you know, of course, you stop the lens down to a small aperture, something like f16 or f22, and so you get a starburst effect. I had no idea that, number one, this was even possible or how to accomplish it. And so I learned that lesson about, you know, really learning in general in photography and in this case, knowing your gear, knowing how your equipment works. And then I made a larger print and was completely surprised, very happily, but surprised to see that there were clouds off in the distance. Of course, then I realized I really should have noticed those clouds at the time I was taking the picture. And so paying attention, paying attention to your subject, to the scene, to the conditions, to what's changing, paying attention all the way around the frame, everything in that frame you should be aware of ideally so that you can deal with it accordingly and produce hopefully the best photo possible, without surprises, ideally. So here I had two surprises, the sunburst effect as well as the clouds, neither of which should have been a surprise. I should have decided whether or not I wanted a sunburst and either stopped down the lens to a small aperture or kept it more wide open if I did not want that starburst effect. And I absolutely should have noticed those clouds and, for example, made sure that I was exposing well for the clouds which in this case, you know, 
well, that stage of my photography, there was still a certain element of dumb luck involved in getting a good exposure from time to time, especially something like this with the sun in the frame. I wouldn't have been surprised if my exposure was completely off, <laughs> wildly off. Uh, so uh, good question, Loretta. So the question here is, how would you have taken this differently? And if I'm being completely honest, if in this scenario, so I grew up in Southern California, and this happens to be at Malibu Creek State Park where the MASH TV show was, or part of where, one of the locations where the MASH TV show was filmed. And so hiking around and going up a trail, looked over my shoulder and just happened to look over my shoulder when the sun was glinting within the leaves, the branches of this oak tree, and decided to take a picture. And if I were there today, I don't know that that would have caught my eye. The tree, you know, you can see there's some branches that have been trimmed away, so it doesn't look quite natural in the, the lower areas. Not quite as interesting. So I think if I were photographing this today, then I would want to zero in on specific details, maybe a close-up of some of the oak leaves, uh, maybe the bark detail, you know, those sorts of things. But in reality, I hopefully would have found maybe a, a more impressive subject, all things considered. Not that you know, it's a beautiful oak tree, but I would have maybe changed things uh, overall. I would have found a different subject to photograph. And, oh yes, good point, uh, Robert, which again was completely by accident. I didn't even notice the clouds were there, but that the branch did not intersect. So if we take a look at this branch, and actually this arc of the branch actually kind of ties in nicely with the clouds, the overall shape there. That too, obviously, was a complete accident because I didn't even notice that the clouds were there at the time. And so, you know, again, in this case, learning a lesson uh, because I was not paying attention, which makes it a little bit of an outtake in that respect. At the time, I didn't consider it an outtake, but nowadays, yeah, it's not my best photo, not my favorite photo, but still a cherished memory. And then I think it's also critically important that you critique your own photos. And part of this, I guess, is just how do you determine is this an outtake or isn't it? You know, is this a photo that I should print and hang on the wall or is it a photo I should delete? Or, you know, of course, there's all sorts of other possibilities in between. And so the reason that I consider critiquing your own photos so important, well, there's a few reasons, actually. So first off, we often tend to be our own worst critic. And also, getting a critique from someone else can, frankly, be a little bit of a challenge. You want the person to be honest with you, but you also want them to be gentle, and you want to give them, you want them to give you good feedback that ideally sort of lines up with your own personal uh, approach to photography, the types of photos that you want to capture. And so just finding the right person to critique your images can be a challenge. And then getting that feedback with, you know, where it's meaningful, meaning it provides some way for you to improve your photography, but it hasn't just destroyed your self-esteem at the same time, it can be a bit of a challenge. And so I think being our own critic works very nicely because you might say, you know, we sort of know ourselves and we know what we were trying to accomplish. The trick is, I think, to, well, separate yourself from the photo from an emotional standpoint if you had been in a, a great place and you know had a nice experience, it doesn't necessarily mean the photo is great, even though it's a nice memory. And what I find is that if you really spend time trying to critique the image and consider what could I have done better or what could I have done differently? Are there other photos that I might have been able to capture of this subject? Are there, you know, just variations? Could I, you know, zero in on a particular portion of the scene, for example? And if you spend time critiquing your photos when there's no pressure, you're sitting at your desk reviewing images on the computer and you know come across some of your favorites or some of your outtakes, and I would say the critique is equally valuable whether you think it's a great photo or a terrible photo. If it's a great photo, what worked about it and what maybe could have been a little bit better or different? And if it's not a great photo, why is it not a great photo? What's not working about it and what could you have changed? And eventually, if you spend time critiquing your own photos after the capture, then you get better at critiquing during the capture. And so here, for example, this, if I remember correctly, I believe this was on the island of Crete in Greece. And 
So we've got these horse and buggy rides available, and I thought they just looked really adorable. And, you know, a horse is always interesting to me. And the buggy was nice. And the gentleman there seems to be taking a nap in the beautiful sea off in the distance, uh, right behind them, framing things up. And so it was an interesting little scene. And so I just stopped and quickly snapped a photo. And as I thought of it, I realized, you know, it, it sort of feels just like a snapshot. I need something else that will uh, lend a little bit of interest, maybe a framing element. And so sometimes this might be from, well, of course, obviously, you might review the photo later after it's too late to make any changes when you're back home reviewing your images on the computer. Or you might get to the point where you can start reviewing your photos on the camera's LCD. I know so many photographers will tell you, don't chimp. Don't look at the LCD. Don't review your photos when you're in the field. But I think there's tremendous value in that as long as reviewing your photos doesn't cause you to miss any other photo opportunities. And so again, the first phase of this self-critique is to review your photos later when it's too late to make any changes. The second phase to me is reviewing on your camera's LCD, kind of looking at the image and trying to figure out what you could have done better. And the third phase is to not even necessarily need to take the sort of outtake photo in the first place, ideally right through the viewfinder without even taking a picture, you could maybe critique and figure out what might work a little better. Am I including areas in the frame that are just clutter? And I actually have a tendency, early in my photography, I would have a tendency to include too much in the frame. I sort of overcompensate these days and, well, or at least compensate, make up for that or those early mistakes, and now try to make sure that I'm distilling a scene down to sort of the bare minimum, as it were. But sometimes I take that too far. And this was exactly one such case. And I realized, you know, I've distilled this down to just the horse and buggy, but now it's not as interesting. And it doesn't give as much of a sense of place. And I realized I could just zoom out just a little bit and over toward the left, ahead of the horse here, there was a lamppost. And I, I think a kind of nice looking lamppost. And I thought that would actually add an additional visual element. And so I thought that made the image more interesting. Not that it's going to produce an award-winning image that I'm going to hang on the wall, but a photo that I'm happier with thanks to the addition of that lamppost. And, you know, I think one of the important things, and I, I would be curious, I should have done a poll uh, for this presentation so I could get your feedback on whether the first image without the light post or the second image represents, in your mind, a better photo. To me, I like the image with the lamp post more, but some of you might disagree. You might feel that that's just unnecessary clutter that's pulling your attention away from the horse and the buggy, and so you might think that the image without the lamp post is better. And what's the right answer? I don't know. <laughs> we may never know. I like the version with the lamp post. Some of you may prefer the version without the lamp post. Some of you may think it's just not neither of these is a worthwhile photo and should have never been captured in the first place. But regardless, and that's part of the reason why I think a self-critique is so important, is so helpful, is because you have a sense of your own preference, your own style in photography. And so, you know, of course, that is going to play a role in that critique. And you sort of, you don't have to filter through somebody else's ideas that don't resonate with your own ideas. You get your own ideas. And so that you can kind of think about the, you know, the overall image and what works best for you. Uh, Eric has a comment here. Would like to also see what's causing the shadow ahead of this sleeping cart. Uh, that's a slippery slope though, <laughs> because as it turns out, what's causing the shadow, and, and I totally understand where you're coming from, but and this is one of the traps that I think a lot of photographers, and I certainly have fallen into this trap plenty of times over the years, is, oh, well, I've left out something. There's a shadow here, and we don't know what the shadow is from. Well, the shadow is from another buggy. So there are a line of buggies offering rides here, horses and buggies. And so if I zoom out a little more to show the buggy that's casting the shadow, now I'm missing the horse attached to that buggy. So I've got to show that horse, but that horse probably also has a shadow. And so eventually I need a, a big panorama, which actually, now that I think about it, that could have been a pretty cool panorama with this line of horses and buggies. But yes, uh, obviously, you know, there's going to be different interpretations. And I absolutely encourage you, by the way, to get critiques of photos from others but do spend some time critiquing your own photos as well, both after the capture as well as 
at the time of capturing your photos. Uh, Sheldon's question here, do you think the horizon going through the man's head is good or bad? I would not call it good, but I wouldn't call it inherently bad. It, it would be, to me, worse if there were just a tiny sliver of his hat sticking up over the horizon or if his hat was lined up right at the top of the horizon. I would not want that horizon line intersecting with his face. Had I noticed that that was the case at the time of capture, now that I'm critiquing after it's too late, I would have tried, if possible, to get a little higher so I could have his entire head and hat set against the water, or I could have ducked down a little lower, of course, then I risk having the horse get up against that horizon. Uh, which, yeah, exactly, Robert is saying slightly higher camera position would have worked. In this case, that would have been very difficult because it was an open courtyard, but had I tried enough, I could have put, a, put some effort into finding something to stand on, for example. And yes, uh, Judith mentions it could be three photos with the horse along with Buddy and the lamp post, uh, Buggy, I should say, in the lamppost, which also reminds me, if there were three horses and buggies, groups of three always works out very nicely as well. So I'm going to have to go back to Greece and get some more pictures <laughs> of these horses and buggies. All right, moving on. Another key lesson that you can learn from outtakes that I've certainly learned, and here's an example, is to make sure that you have a subject. And generally, you know, it's often suggested that you should have one subject in your photo, one key subject, and I think that often makes sense. It's not an absolute, and sort of we can define subject very loosely. So, you know, the subject here could be the color, and so then I can claim I do have a subject. But with this photo, and I was very excited. Now, I mentioned I grew up in Southern California, in the Los Angeles area, where it does not snow. You can drive an hour or so to the mountains and find some snow or out to the high desert and get some snow. But I grew up without snow, and so I still to this day get very excited when it snows. And here I was upstate New York doing some video recording uh, in the wintertime. This was in the studio recording, and I was excited about the snow, of course. And it turned into this you know, sort of foggy late afternoon, and I thought that was really wonderful. And then a little bit before sunset, the color started to, to improve. Obviously, we're not going to get a glorious sunset, but getting some color from, you know, the sunset with the clouds and coming through the fog and whatnot. And so I hustled out and went wandering around in the snow and tried to find, there was this little stream and the plants here and the trees. And I, I was trying, I was trying to make something out of this, but there just wasn't a subject. I needed something else. I, I needed to have, you know, maybe a tree in the foreground or a nice big boulder in the stream or something that would, you know, obviously give me a key subject to focus in on because here it's just a lot of clutter. There's interesting elements. The snow is nice and the plants and the trees and the reflection and the water and the fog and the color, but it's all just sort of a clutter without any clear subject and I don't know where to look my eyes just kind of wander all around the photo and so I needed to have some sort of subject here to tie everything together essentially and so this just it didn't work it was a wonderful experience it was wonderful light and color and the snow of course was exciting for me and the fog was was interesting but I didn't come away with a photo, at least not from this little location where I had visited. And then when you're setting up your photo, it's really important to watch your framing. And this is one of the, I think, most common mistakes. Oh, and actually, uh, I see just a comment here from Gene about the possibility of going vertical. So let me back up, oh, not that far, back up to this image. Yeah, certainly there's the possibility of a vertical shot. So you can see the trees at the top right, reflections at the bottom right. If I could have gotten down really low to compress that scene so that that middle ground in between is not taking up so much space, then certainly a vertical. Or even looking down at the water and just getting a photo of only the water only the reflections with the color and the texture. Maybe a little bit of the snow on the opposite bank would have been interesting. And so, yeah, and, and also, yeah, good point from Gilbert. What about more of the trees and less of the reflection? And so I, I love this because there's so many different possible answers. There's more than one right answer with any given subject or scene. And this, the questions and comments that I'm getting here from some of you those are exactly the sorts of things that you want to be thinking about, ideally critiquing 
in the moment through the viewfinder and saying, you know, it's just not working. But how can I make it work? Maybe those trees in the background. Maybe I need to cross this stream, get my feet wet and cross over and explore by those trees or, or focus just on the reflection or find a different angle or move you know, up or down or yes, macro. So the snow, which is certainly interesting. Some of those plants over on the far side were really interesting. And so getting some close up details of those. So even though I started off thinking, oh, I need this wide view of this wonderful color and landscape, maybe the real shot, the better shot, is a close-up detail of some of the elements within the overall frame. And yeah, exactly. So if we crop creatively, then that could also help to define a subject within the frame. All right, so back to that framing. Again, this is a mistake that I see so many photographers making in terms of you know having an interesting subject. So this is the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta, as many of you are familiar with, I'm sure. Hopefully you've had an opportunity to photograph. If not, at your next opportunity, I definitely highly recommend it. It's an amazing show to see, as it were, with hundreds of balloons up in the air and wonderful for photography as well. And a bit challenging, the balloons do not move all that quickly. And yet, when you've got multiple balloons in the frame and you're trying to get a good shot, they drift relative to each other fast enough that when you get something working well on one side of the frame, suddenly the other side of the frame isn't working all that well. I took so many photos trying to get good framing, and I, I certainly got some good photos, but this one, regrettably, I would call an outtake simply because of that balloon down at the bottom of the frame, the lowest balloon in the frame here. It's just too close. Now, thankfully, in Photoshop, I can extend that frame very, very easily. But ideally, we get the photo perfect right from the start. So yeah, Judith's question, uh, well, comment here. Good place for content to wear move. Yeah, so content to wear move, I could move that balloon upward a little bit, or I could extend the canvas and use content to wear fill to add in some sky very, very easily. But I also want to make sure that I'm learning the lesson to get the photo right in the first place and just trying to pay attention. Now, ideally, I would holler out to the pilot of the balloon there and say, can you, you know, fire the burner and get up a little bit higher for me? Of course, he wouldn't hear me or maybe I had a radio, but then every, all the other balloons are drifting at the same time. So to try to coordinate that would be wildly impossible. But the point is that, you know, as you're capturing and framing things up to make sure that you're at least quickly glancing around the entire edge of the frame. And in this case, you know, I could have, well, maybe zoomed out just a little bit or tilted the camera down just a little bit, but I don't want to have something that's really, really close to that frame if I can avoid it. I want a little breathing room there. And so, you know, making sure that ideally I'm getting framing where I have nothing problematic around the edges. It's not to say that the edge has to be totally clean. In a photo like this, that would be ideal with clean sky all the way around. But it means that there's no sort of visual distractions. There's no object that's kind of pulling you to that edge of the frame because it looks odd the way it's sort of cut off or nearly cut off. And I also had a similar experience which proved rather frustrating. This was in Cartagena, Colombia, and I was photographing, it was wonderful late afternoon light, and there were some flamingos in this area, and they were just not cooperating. And so trying to find one that had interesting light and shadow, and you know, as soon as I would, you know, kneel down and, and frame up, they would move or turn their head or, you know, whatever the case might be. And I got this shot and I finally said, oh, I got it. Thank goodness. I finally got a shot that I'm happy with and I left. And then later I realized I cut it way too close. Now this is another one that I could probably certainly extend with content to wear fill, for example. But it was so frustrating to see that even after all these years and reminding photographers to watch the edges of the frame that I still walked away with an outtake. Well, I'm still happy with the photo but I'm frustrated by the fact that I didn't leave enough space up at the top of the photo, so not framing too tightly. And that is especially true, by the way, if you do any architectural photography, you might want to adjust the perspective, and that means you wanna have a little bit of room for cropping after applying those perspective corrections. And so kind of my general rule with photographing buildings is shoot a little bit wide, because you're probably going to want to correct the perspective to make the building look more properly vertical, for example. Uh, 
and then you're going to need to crop and you don't want to you know, cut off part of the building when you do have to crop in that way, for example. So leaving a little bit of extra space. We don't want to leave too much space and you know, waste pixels as it were, but trying to make sure that we're not being too tight with our framing. When in doubt, give it just a little bit of space. And then when it comes to wide angle photography, I think many of us are probably already familiar with the notion of having a strong foreground for wide angle. Uh, I suppose, if I were being honest, the real lesson here might be, don't be stubborn. This angle was just not going to work. Uh, and there were countless mosquitoes. <laughs> we came away with lots of mosquito bites. And this, as some of you may recognize or might assume, is along the coast of Maine. And I actually was doing a scouting trip. I had been to Maine a number of times and realized, of course, the beautiful coastline and the lighthouses and thought, you know, this might be a good location for a field photography workshop and especially focused on the coast and on lighthouses. As it turns out in Maine, in a lot of areas, it's not super easy to get to the coast itself because a lot of it is private property, but the lighthouses you can generally get reasonably close to. One of the funny things about lighthouses on the coast of Maine, though, is that they they put them right on the coast. And so depending on the particular landscape, it can be a little bit tricky to get a good angle. And this certainly was one of those situations where it was a challenge. Uh, it also demonstrated why maybe the photo workshop wasn't the best idea without really good liability insurance anyway, because in many cases to get a view of the lighthouse, you've got to climb out onto these rocks. They're slippery. They're hard, and you don't want to fall or drop your gear into the water. And so this was a particular challenge, and I kept trying and trying. And because the foreground wasn't fabulous, to get this angle, you know, I'm out there, I, you could claim that the rocks at the bottom right are the foreground subject, but I personally wouldn't call that a very strong subject in the foreground. I could claim that the long exposure creating the interesting texture in the water, that that sort of became my subject. But the reality is this is a photo of, well, I should say not subject, but the strong foreground, except it's still not strong. <laughs> and the subject is that lighthouse in the background. It's rather diminutive. So the real angle here would have been to get out into or onto the water. So perhaps there was a shot with, in fact, I would say, you know, under ideal circumstances, if I could have gotten right in front of this boulder, perhaps, put this in the bottom right corner of my frame, so maybe I'm, you know, somehow magically standing on a ladder in the water right here, and this rock could be in the foreground at the bottom right, and then, of course, the lighthouse would be then up, you know, toward the top, maybe toward the top left of the frame, still fairly wide-angle shot. That could have worked out very nicely, potentially, or being out on the water, out over, you know, somewhere in this position, for example, and not going wide angle and just having the lighthouse with the rocks in the foreground and the trees. And so, you know, it just, I think in this case, I just needed to realize that this angle wasn't going to work. It's very difficult to get an angle to this lighthouse from land. You would really need to get out into the water. And again, if I'm going to shoot wide angle, which in this case I obviously did, then naturally, I would want to make sure that there's a strong foreground subject somehow. With this, I just sort of have this big open space of sorts in the foreground and in the sky up at the top left. And so the rest of the frame isn't really supporting the lighthouse. It's just, you know, I should have maybe even used a longer lens and zeroed in on the lighthouse as well. All right. And if you do crop too tightly, is there a problem adding more to the edge in post. It depends on the edge. And so, you know, for example, with a hot air balloon shot, that would be very easy. Photoshop would make easy work of filling in some extra sky. With the flamingo, it would be easy for the dark area above the flamingo, but it would be a little bit of a challenge for the feather textures for the flamingo. And yes, absolutely leave room, uh, just reiterating what I said earlier, leave room around the buildings so that when you apply perspective corrections, you're going to have some additional space to work with. And yeah, a couple of you noting that in this case, a vertical shot probably would have worked a little bit 
nicer, but I was being stubborn. Remember, that was the other lesson I learned here. But yes, if we think of, you know, sort of this side of the frame, if we kind of crop the right third of the image here, that does start to become more interesting. I could have maybe gotten sort of a, a view looking down on the rocks over on the right hand side. And that would have, you know, probably worked reasonably well. Also, the angle to the lighthouse is still a little bit challenging, a little bit problematic. Uh, yes, there's a good example of where a drone might have come in handy, as long as drones are allowed in the particular area. I'm actually not sure on the main coast if they've done anything to restrict drone usage, but drones can also make it much easier to get the right angle <laughs> when, when you can't physically get there very easily. Uh, in this case, not without getting wet and possibly damaging your, your camera gear. But yeah, a drone can certainly be very, very effective. All right, and then also on the subject of composition, when it comes to close-up images, carefully compose those close-ups. And you know, often you say, oh, I look at the wonderful water droplets and the texture and the color is a very nice subtle color, but it's just not that interesting. <laughs> it's not working. And especially when you've got a close-up angle, when you're getting very close, we start to form these sort of abstracts then the details start to become all the more important. So you can see, by the way, up at the top center here, there's a little bit of something sticking into the frame, probably another bud up there, and the, the sort of dead ends of the petals here, the, the leaves there. And so, you know, just details that are problematic and just not interesting versus finding a good angle for a close-up where we've got a nice, strong composition of a single flower in this case. And... So, you know, being able to pay careful attention. And I would say with close-up photography, that's where paying attention to the edges is more important and also more challenging. Where, you know, I want to include just a little more. Oh, now I've got part of this object. I need to include even more. And before you know it, it's no longer a close-up photo. All right. And then finding the right balance between light and shadow. You know, I especially tend to get really excited about my photography when there's a strong display of light and shadow. This is in Rome, Italy, by the way, near Altare della Patria. And I was actually really excited about this shot. And I thought it was going to work out really nicely. The strong contrast, foreground shadow versus background lighting, the columns and the shape and the repeated patterns and, you know, so much more. And I, you know, at first glance, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I got a good shot. And I showed my wife, and she said, no, it's terrible. <laughs> and it might have taken a while for that to sink in. But I realized you know, there's just way too much shadow dominating the foreground here. We would need, you know, if it was the opposite, it could have been more interesting with illuminated in the foreground and dark in the background or a close-up vertical. So taking a look in this little area here, maybe a vertical would have worked there where we've got a little bit stronger lighting effect as opposed to very strong shadow that's sort of dominating the frame. And so, you know, trying to find the right balance. When you get excited about that light and shadow, make sure that you've got a good balance between. And that generally speaking, I think of the light areas, the illuminated areas as being more important and the shadow areas as being supporting actors effectively. Also, uh, I've certainly learned, uh, not that often if I'm being honest, but enough as a, to serve as a valuable reminder that shooting in RAW really is important. It's one of those things where it's not critical with most photos, but can be helpful. And in certain situations, it's absolutely critical. So this actually, I was <laughs> in San Diego photographing birds, not this kind of bird, this is an airplane that flew by, and I was actually just taking a quick documentary series of photos, uh, not intending to do anything with them. I just had never seen this airplane before and wanted to look it up and find out what it was. And somehow my camera didn't adjust the exposure as the sun came into the frame, didn't adjust quickly enough, and so I ended up with this shot. But with RAW, I could actually recover a pretty good amount of detail. Now, this is just a snapshot to see what kind of airplane this was. And there are a variety of problems with this image, but it helped to illustrate the real value of shooting in RAW and how much you can recover in situations where you otherwise the photo might have been lost. And yeah, so good point, Mac, in terms of the, the first close up there that was not working of the flower that, you know, maybe the lighting's very flat. Maybe we could add some backlighting to make it more interesting. Certainly that could be interesting as well.
And also there's a comment slash question of focus stacking. So for the close-ups, yes, if you want more depth of field with close-up or macro photography, focus stacking can be critical because you're not going to be able to get enough depth of field when it comes to focusing very closely on a subject. All right. And then another, <laughs> some of you, and especially if you've been on any trips with me that involve photography, you probably know that I, I don't use a tripod all the time. Okay, I don't use a tripod very much at all, but I do try to make a point of having a tripod with me. This photo, uh, you may recognize this as the skyline of Detroit, Michigan. I was in Detroit just to present. Of course, I had a camera with me, but I didn't have any real camera gear, just the camera, probably just one lens, in fact. And I realized that while I was in Detroit, Canada is right across the border. And so I decided, let's go to Canada for dinner. Why not? Just on a lark. It seemed like an amusing, fun idea at the time. And when I got over, this is in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, and across the river from Detroit, said, oh, well, that's kind of a nice skyline. I should stop and take a picture. So I stopped and realized this is foolish. I don't have a tripod. And uh, it was windy. And I'm not that steady to begin with. I like to think I am, but uh, come on now. It's a night shot. <laughs> and this is quite a while ago when if I had cranked up the ISO enough to get a sharp image, it would have been noisy as could be. And so, you know, the best tripod, you know, there's the, the old saying, the best camera is the one you have with you. Well, the best tripod is also the one that you actually brought with you on a trip. And so uh, even if it's just a little travel tripod to try to make sure that you can capture some images, even when you don't anticipate that. And I saw Max uh, note needing uh, better depth of field with the columns image. And it, here is an example. So this is in Yosemite Valley in the winter. And I was wandering around in the snow and having a great time, of course, because I love the snow. And saw this branch and the leaf with the frost on it, which looked really interesting. Captured an image and thought, wow, this is just going to be great. And so... The, you know, I, I thought it was going to be a really nice photo. And then I got it to the computer and realized, oh, I didn't end up with enough depth of field. And I happen to be a fan of narrow depth of field in general. And so if we take a look here, you know, we've got the leaf and the branch and the frost in focus. And then the background, of course, rendered out of focus. The problem is, especially the leaf, we've got this portion of the leaf that's out of focus. So here it's in focus, there it's out of focus. I don't have enough depth of field. And the branch down here is out of focus, whereas the central area is in focus, and up there it goes out of focus again. I needed more depth of field. I should have, well, been smarter maybe, or uh, taken a test shot and evaluated or calculated depth of field using an app on my smartphone. This actually was lo so long ago, this particular photo, that there were no smartphones to do that math with. But trying to make sure, you know, I wanted narrow depth of field so the background's out of focus, but now I've gone too narrow and my subject is not entirely in focus. So being careful about that as well. And then I also am not one that uses flash all that often, uh, but in this situation I decided it was necessary. This was during an amazing road trip throughout Spain uh, and a little bit of Portugal and saw this field of sunflowers. It was right about sunset. So we excitedly, you know, pulled over and went out to the field and started photographing. I thought, you know, clever me, a sunflower with the sun in the background. And we'll even stop down and get a sunburst effect. But obviously with the backlighting, it was a bit strong. So I just decided I would fire the flash. Part of the problem for me is that in the, well, here, the, uh, the obvious problem photographically to me is that the background is way too dark. The uh, flower off to the bottom left and, you know, in the distance there, there's not enough detail. And it, it's not even so much that I need the detail of the background as it is that there's just a real imbalance between the flash illumination and the rest of the scene. And so uh, to me, this was just a, a complete outtake. In fairness to myself, if I can make an excuse for myself... <laughs> It was really hot. This was, as it happened, it was in July, in summer, in Spain. Really, really hot, really, really humid. I was just dripping wet after just a few minutes out and was eager to get back to the car and the air conditioning. So I, <laughs> I wasn't being as careful or taking as much time as I should have to capture the image. But when you're using flash, 
more often than not, I would say that using flash at a reduced strength is almost always good. Using flash for fill, at least when you have other light to work with, is usually good. And uh, yeah, certainly, if I had thought about this nowadays, I probably would have still fired the flash, but I also would have bracketed the exposure to create an HDR image as well. And yes, likewise, you could bracket for focus as well with the images that didn't have enough depth of field. You can bracket for focus uh, to do focus stacking there as well. All right. And then, you know, another lesson, which is not something we can necessarily do anything about in many cases, but that weather can be critical. So this, I'm sure many of you have seen me share photos from this location. It's looking through a keyhole, which makes it all the more magical, through the keyhole of a door, through this archway of shrubs, of hedges and then St. Peter's Basilica in the background, but here on a very hazy day, so it's just not working all that well. Go on a blustery, windy day where the wind has blown all of the haze out of Rome, and through that same keyhole, you can get a much better image. That weather can really, really be important and really can make the shot. And sometimes you might think, oh, the weather's so terrible, we should just give up. This was during a photo workshop that I was leading in New York City, so I didn't have the option really to give up. I needed to try to produce the best opportunities for my clients, even when the weather was not cooperating at all. There were severe thunderstorms in the area, but I watched the weather very closely and made a plan. So we went over to Brooklyn and photographed before the storm came through. Then we went and got dinner, a nice extended dinner while the thunderstorms were wreaking havoc. And then once the storms passed, then we went back out to the view here in between the Brooklyn and the Manhattan bridges with lower Manhattan in the background. And you can see just a little hint of color. So I knew there was promise. Little did I know how much the weather, as much as it had caused problems for us earlier in the day, it really gave us quite the show shortly thereafter. So our patience was rewarded and watching the weather carefully was rewarded. Uh, and in fact, I was even rewarded with a very lucky lightning strike shot. But the color in the sky was just magical. And maybe 15 or 20 minutes later, as the sun got further down and the color started shifting, I was able to get this photo as well, which I was very happy with. I've also learned on more than one occasion, and especially leading photo workshops out in the Palouse region, the farming area of eastern Washington state and northern Idaho, that you don't want to delay. If you have the opportunity to get out there and photograph, this is an old barn that I photographed the very first time that I visited the Palouse region of eastern Washington state. And then two years later, this is a photo that I captured of the same barn. And so just in general, if you're interested in visiting the Palouse, I would certainly do that sooner rather than later because increasingly, you know, barns and farmhouses are falling down. And so trying to take advantage of opportunities as much as you possibly can along the way, trying, making sure that you're not missing out on opportunities. I was reminded of another example of that. This is a door photograph. This happens to be in the Trastevere neighborhood of Rome, Italy, one of my favorite parts of Rome to just wander around on foot and find areas to photograph, scenes to photograph. And this is kind of off this beaten path, you might say. It's this little alleyway back behind one of the main piazzas in the Trastevere neighborhood. Uh, and, you know, not the nicest looking little back street might be one that you'd look around the corner and say, never mind, I think I'm going to stay on the main road. But I found this door back there, which looked very nice, the, the faded orange and the, the greens of both the door and the ivy and the line of the drainage. Normally, I wouldn't include a, a drainage pipe in a photo, but it seemed to balance things out nicely. And I came away with a photo that I was happy with. And then in future years, when I would lead field photography workshops in Rome, I would take people to the same neighborhood, and unfortunately, this photo is not really something that you can capture unless you bring some paint with you be in a trash bag because this is what the scene looked like on a more recent visit with rubbish all over the place and graffiti painted all over the walls. And Rome is not even an area that really has a significant amount of graffiti, all things considered. But here in the, you know this one little spot that I really thought was a nice door for photographing. I got a, a great shot, good opportunity early on. You can see the, the plants have grown down further. And so now the original shot is really just impossible. 
Uh, and of course, there's other opportunities. There's plenty of opportunities in Rome to photograph, but this particular subject that I had enjoyed photographing is one that is no more. So trying to make sure that you're taking advantage of opportunities as they arise and making the most. If there's something on your photographic bucket list, I would certainly try to, to check that off the list sooner rather than later just to make sure that you don't miss out. And then, in many cases, creating intentional outtakes. And there's a variety of... Uh, sort of scenarios where this might play out, where you're intentionally trying, experimenting. I know this isn't going to work, but I want to try and see how it works out. Or in a situation where you know that it's not going to be easy to get a great shot right from the start just because of the circumstances. So out in the Palouse, it was a really windy day, but there were some nice fields of canola, bright yellow flowers that just blanket the hillside. Normally, I want no wind for photographing flowers, so if they're not moving, I can get some nice close-up shots. But I thought, you know, we could make the most of that wind. We can make a point of essentially embracing the wind. And so I set up a tripod and a neutral density filter, even though I almost didn't need it because it was such a blustery day, and started photographing. I set the canola, the yellow canola flowers, set against the blue sky, complementary colors, and thought, well, this is going to be great. So here's a shot. Not great. And here's another shot. Uh, you know, there's some interesting elements there, but it's not working out all that great. And this one, not so great. And so some of this was finding the right angle to the subject. Some of this was finding the right shutter speed to render the right amount of motion. Some of it was timing. You know, the wind is not at a constant velocity. It comes and goes with bursts, you know, gusts and whatnot. And so it takes some practice. So if you're photographing something, you know, moving subject, it might take a variety of shots, you know, burst mode, for example, uh, during a sporting event would be another example, where you need to capture multiple photos in order to hopefully get the right photo, <clears throat> the, the photo captured at the right moment. And so here was one of the photos that I came away with that actually I thought worked reasonably well. So I created, I didn't count them, and I don't want to count them because it's a lot, but I created a lot of outtakes knowing that most of them were going to be outtakes, and then this ended up being my favorite photo from the day, but lots and lots of outtakes to get a result I was happy with. And so again, in a situation like this, it's sort of just part of the equation that we need to capture a lot of images to find the one that works, or it might involve practice if it's a technique that you're you know, panning with a moving subject, for example, that you might not be well practiced in, or whatever the case might be, or just experimenting. Let's try some. This may not work, but let's give it a try just in case, because if it does work, you're going to be really happy that you gave it a try. And then one of the lessons, I actually learned this really early on from one of my mentors in photography, and have been reminded of that, and sometimes at my own peril, and that is to be ready. Always be ready for your next shot. I was taught early on, you know, when you put your camera away, try to have it configured for whatever you think is going to be a good set of settings for that next image. You know, can you anticipate which lens you're likely going to want the next time you use your camera or the aperture setting or, you know, whatever the case might be. And certainly it's good advice. Sometimes it's tricky to anticipate. Uh, here, this is on a boat on the inside passage of Alaska and I was able to anticipate on some level, I knew there were whales in the water and we were hoping to see them. And I had a 100 to 400 millimeter lens on the camera. But this is not a whale that we knew was there. We were motoring along and I suspect the whale was sleeping unbeknownst to us and that our approach startled it. It apparently woke up and then breached several times before swimming off. And I, it was such a surprise even though I was on the bow of the boat with camera in hand, 100 to 400 millimeter lens on the camera, but locked down at 100 millimeters, I wasn't even fast enough to get that lens unlocked and zoom in to 400 millimeters. And so this photo involved a bit of cropping. It's not the best angle to the whale. It's, it's not the best photo. And in fact, if I go back to the original shot, that would be this. And if I had gotten to 400 millimeters, then I might have actually had a reasonably good shot at least documenting the breach. Instead, it just turned into a look. Look at the whale that I was not able to photograph very well because I was caught off guard. So ideally, you know, to the extent that it's possible, being ready for your next shot. 
And then after the fact, so I've talked about, you know, sort of critiquing before versus after, you know, during the process of photographing a scene versus after the fact when you're back home, for example. But one of the things you can do is to really study your metadata. And I've talked about this image in the past, this, this scene, where, you know, a long exposure doesn't have to be super long. And I know many photographers have a tendency to push right to the longest exposure they can possibly get. And that might work. And if possible, a scene like this that's not going to be changing dramatically in the short term, you know, take your time and set up as many shots, as many shutter speeds in this particular case and try to figure out what's going to work and test. But if you study your metadata, you'll start to develop a sense of what's working. So here, for example, this is a 15-second exposure of an alpine stream in Austria. And this is the same scene photographed at a quarter of a second. And I like the texture of this one more. But the point here in terms of studying metadata, it's not important as to which of the two versions you necessarily think is better or which style you might want for your own long exposure photographs. But by studying your metadata and saying, okay, this was the image at 15 seconds and this is the image at a quarter of a second. So I can start to get a sense of when I want a really long exposure versus when I don't based on the amount of movement in the frame. And so again, it's something that I think is helpful in terms of evaluating metadata. Here, using shutter speed as an example for depth of field, if you're not happy with the amount of depth of field, take a look at the lens aperture setting. Could you have used a different aperture and gotten more or less depth of field as the case may be? And so just evaluating the image and then looking at the camera settings in metadata to help you learn what could you have done better or differently at the time of capture. What can you do better next time, essentially? And then fix it in post. Okay, not exactly. <laughs> it's one of those phrases that I don't really like to hear. Or, you know, fix it in Photoshop. I don't recommend that you plan to fix things in Photoshop. But do keep in mind that there is the opportunity. Many of the mistakes that I've shared here in some of these photographs along the way, for example, could have been fixed in post-processing or the image can be improved. You know, if you look at the photo and say it's an outtake by virtue of it's just not what I was hoping for. It doesn't convey the mood that I was looking for. Well, especially I think this is a good example of that because mood is exa exactly the issue that I ran into here. This was during a visit to Tokyo in Japan, had an amazing experience and it was taken by sort of the timelessness and the sense of tradition and of age, of history. And the photo just didn't seem to capture it. And I, I felt there was potential there. And so I tried to think about what sort of adjustments would reflect what I felt was the mood of the experience or of the photo. And so I converted to black and white with a color tint for a sepia tone type of effect, enhanced contrast, added a, a bit of in, a vignette, tried to apply adjustments that got the photo closer to what I was aiming for at the time of capture. And this was the final result of that. And so, you know, as you're critiquing, keep in mind, many of the things that you might have wished had worked out differently for a photo can be fixed in post-processing. I don't recommend using that as a crutch. I still try to make sure that you're getting the best photo possible at the time of capture in the camera. But that said, when you end up with a photo that's not quite right, that could just use some improvements, there's a good chance you could make those improvements in terms of the post-processing of the image. And a good question, Pat. So when I crop, do I crop to a standard size? As a very general rule, I would say no. I crop based on the image. And if that means I have to get the image, if I'm gonna print it, that I need to custom mat and frame, that I'm fine with that. If there's images with different aspect ratios in a slideshow presentation, I don't. that doesn't bother me at all. I crop based on the image, not based on a particular aspect ratio. That said, if I'm getting very, very close to where it looks like almost a square crop, then I would say you need to make it a perfect square crop. But as a general rule, no, I do not crop to any standard aspect ratio. Um, Paul mentions at his uh, camera club presentation, uh, the speaker said that they take 500 photos to get one keeper. That's, uh, this varies depending. So the, the rule when I was coming up in photography, back in the days of film photography, was that you were hoping to get one good frame 
from a single roll. So out of a roll of 36 frames, you're hoping for one good one. Now with digital, we can take so many more photos so much more easily that that ratio has changed a bit. But you know, depending, ideally you're gonna get the perfect shot with one press of the shutter release button, depending on you know your experience and your skill and your ability to sort of critique through the viewfinder as opposed to later, it might take a few more. When in doubt, capture additional images of that frame, of that subject or scene finding you know different angles different perspectives different framing and you know really try to learn from the experience any of the photos you know the photos that worked out great absolutely think about what worked and what you can continue doing in the future but the photos that did not work out as well try to figure out what you could have done so that the next time you can do that all right so thank you once again for joining me today there's another question here if there's other questions i'll be happy to answer those as well but i do want to thank you for joining me for this presentation and note some of you joined me for my recent gray learning virtual photo conference i believe that was in february if memory serves we're going to have another one save the date saturday june 12th an all-day series of presentations so stay tuned for details on that it will be free to attend the full live online presentations for the entire day. Uh, in the meantime, uh, <laughs> good one, Douglas. Uh, did you take the photo or make the photo? I am sure I mostly use the term take, but I certainly make. I think that was, uh, if I remember correctly, that was Ansel Adams, yes? Uh, that something to the effect of the best photos being you make your best photos, not take your best photos. And so, uh, very good point. And uh, another one here from David, uh, Car uh, well, I can't pronounce it all that well uh, with the uh, French accent, but Cartier-Bresson, the decisive moment, absolutely holds true. And that sort of gets to that notion of creating intentional outtakes. You know, what is the decisive moment? It's sort of that, that perfect, which, you know, we all might define it differently for a given scene or subject, but that perfect moment, that it was timed just right. And so there's an element of, you know, you compose the scene and wait for the right moment. But sometimes, of course, you've got to capture a wide variety of images, capture lots of outtakes so you can pick the decisive moment after the fact. Uh, ideally not, but sometimes, you know, with the canola bouncing around in the breeze, for example, that can be a bit of a challenge. And... Uh, yeah, so good question, Samuel. So the question here is when you're asked to critique another photographer's work, <clears throat> do you or should you begin with trying to understand what they intended uh, or what they wanted to capture or their general criticisms that can be addressed? So a couple of different things there, I would say. Number one, yeah, of course there's the, shall we say, standard the rules that you know we sort of want to follow in general not that they can't be broken but you know if a photo is out of focus and it should be in focus that's obviously pretty straightforward and it is worthy of an automatic critique but as a general rule especially when it comes to composition yes ultimately i want <clears throat> excuse me to understand what the photographer was aiming for my personal approach and what you might sort of request if somebody's reviewing your own photos is to not ask them anything first so my first approach is to talk out loud, think out loud, I guess you could say, about what I think was the intent based on how I interpret the photo. Here's what I think you were going for. And then I want the photographer to tell me whether I was right and what they were actually going for and then take it from there. And another tip on critiques, by the way, if you're going to have somebody else critique your photos, the best question you can ask is, what would you have done differently? Some photographers who critique images are going to be brutally honest and it might be a little painful. Others are just going to talk about what they like and it's not going to be necessarily the good co constructive criticism that I think is most helpful. But ask what they would have done differently. And that often will provide the best insights into how you can improve your photography. Uh, thank you, Tim. Appreciate that. And... Ah, a good idea, Robert. I like that idea. So presentation in the future, talking about some of the pictures within the pictures. I will add that to the list for future presentations, an upcoming presentation as part of the Gray Learning 
webinar series. So once again, thank you all so much for joining me today for the live presentation. We will, as always, have a recording available, so we'll send a follow-up email to those of you who registered so that you can access a recording if you'd like to watch the presentation again. In the meantime, thanks very much. I'll hope to see you back online for a future presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series. And I definitely hope to see all of you at the upcoming Gray Learning virtual photo conference coming up on Saturday, June 12th. Stay tuned for more details. Thanks very much.